There is a great deal of controversy today about a new and powerful technology called genetic engineering. We talked to a number of scientists, environmentalists, and ethical experts about some of the issues in these debates. Biologist Richard Burgess, former head of the Biotechnology Center at the University of Wisconsin, puts the issues into perspective. We asked Dr. Burgess just what is genetic engineering? Um, usually I'm asked what is biotechnology, <laughs> and I say it's not just genetic engineering. Uh, genetic engineering is, is the ability to isolate individual genes and produce, um, and duplicate them to cut and paste the genetic information, the DNA. Well, what is biotechnology? <laughs> well, biotechnology is a, is a general term that's been given to, has many definitions, but I think the most understandable and, and straightforward one is it's applied biology. It's using the knowledge that's been gained by basic research in biology to, for practical purposes, for uh, producing new products, producing new processes. And, of course, that means it's not new. It's been, um, people have been domesticating animals, domesticating plants, breeding plants for improved food production for thousands of years. They've been making wine and cheese and beer by fermenting and using microorganisms to convert in food processing for thousands of years. What is new then? So I, I tend to think of there being three major powerful new tools that have been created in the last few decades that give us the ability to do things we couldn't have dreamed of doing in the past. One is genetic engineering, the ability to cut and splice DNA. One of them is cell biology and the ability to do tissue culture, to grow cells from an organism in a, in a tissue culture. Um, this has gone from being an art to a science in the last decade and as a result it's available for researchers. And finally, I think the development of computers and instrumentation, analytical instrumentation, has allowed us to analyze protein and DNA much more sensitively and accurately than we could ever have done in the past. Here is an example of how genetic engineers are using these new tools to produce new plant varieties. What do you do when your beautiful field of barley is being destroyed by a fungus? In the past, farmers have tried many methods, rotating their crops, trying different varieties, adding chemicals. Today, here at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Cereal Crops Research Unit in Madison, Wisconsin, they use gene cut and paste techniques and what is called a gene gun to create a new variety of barley plant that will resist the fungus without chemical aid. First, they found a species of oats that was able to resist the fungus. They were able to identify the particular molecular part of the oats plant that gave it this power. This molecular part is a DNA fragment in all the cells of the plant. That DNA fragment is a gene. And they cut this fungus-resisting gene out of an oats plant cell with special newly discovered chemicals called restriction enzymes. Once cut loose from its original strand of DNA, the DNA fragment, the gene, is pasted into a special bacterium plasmid with the help of another special enzyme. Then they multiply the plasmids using a technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. They mix the new bacterium plasmids that now contain the fungus-resistant gene with gold dust. And now they're ready. And what we do is uh, we take uh, barley like this and then we take a, um, a small seed from which we dissect the embryo, which is right here at the end. And we uh, transfer the gene which we want into the little embryo with the help of a gene gun. Okay, this is the gene gun and this is the chamber where the actually bombardment is done. 
They put thousands of copies of the new fungus-resistant gene on the very fine gold dust, and then with a burst of pressure, the gold dust, with genes attached, is shot into the tiny barley embryos. They grow the bombarded embryos on special culture media and select the ones that have taken up the fungus-resistant gene. They are now called transgenic plants. And eventually, from these transgenic embryos, they grow mature barley plants that will be resistant to the destructive fungus and that will be suitable for large-scale reproduction in the barley fields of the United States, Canada, and Northern Europe. You can use the same process to cut and paste useful genes into many other plants and animals. Dr. Burgess explains a project that genetically engineers fungi, a project with broad implications for energy and for the environment. This is how do you make paper. Paper is um, typically made by taking wood, which is made up simplistically of cellulose fibers, which is what you want for paper, and lignin, which is the glue that holds the fibers together. The typical process for making paper pulp is to dissolve the lignin with chemicals. This is extremely, uh, requires a great number of harsh chemicals, uh, leads to a loss of 50% of the mass of the wood, which is this lignin, roughly, and that becomes a waste in itself. And so you have waste streams coming out of pulp mills, which are undesirable. You've lost 50% of the mass of the wood. Um, alternatively, you can do something called mechanical pulping, which is a physically shearing or breaking down the wood into fibers. The problem there is that it requires a very large amount of energy, and it produces a very weak paper because the fibers are short. And what the researchers here have done uh, in the last few years is to demonstrate that you can treat wood chips with a biological uh, treatment. In this case, treating them with fungus. I mean, fungi grow on dead trees and rot them and allow their materials to be converted to re be recycled in nature. Those fungi, there are special ones that will degrade lignin. So if we treat wood chips with the right kind of fungi under the right kind of conditions, we can tenderize or soften the wood chip. Now we can do mechanical pulping, getting uh, very large savings of energy, as much as 50%, and at the same time producing longer fibers that can lead to stronger um, paper and avoiding the, the use of the, the chemicals in the process. So here's an example of going from a chemical pulping to what we would call a biomechanical pulping. Uh, that's come by understanding how to grow fungi and how to improve fungi. Similar methods are being used around the world in the 21st century to produce transgenic wheat that can resist common parasites, transgenic cotton that will resist the boll weevil, drought-resistant corn with high oil levels, drought-resistant rice with high levels of vitamin A, cottonwood trees that can soak up mercury from polluted soil, potatoes that can make their own pesticides, soybeans that can resist weed killers and produce higher yields. Many millions of acres in the United States, Canada, Mexico, China, India, and other countries around the world are using transgenic plants today to increase food production, to cut down on the use of chemicals, prevent soil erosion, decrease the land needed for agriculture, and increase the areas that can be turned back into wetlands and wilderness. Now, this new science can potentially be of great help to the world's poorest continent, Africa, although thus far it has not been used extensively there. Two of the most important foods in Africa, for instance, are cassava and bananas. Cassava is the staple food for 250 million people, not only in Africa, but in other countries of Latin America and Asia. Unfortunately, the natural cassava plant contains cyanide, so it must be pounded and soaked repeatedly to leach out the poison before cooking. 
genetic engineers using cut and paste techniques are now working to create new varieties of cassava that would produce less cyanide and more protein. Genetic engineers have already produced a banana that can resist a common airborne fungus that right now is causing great destruction to banana trees in Uganda and other African countries. They are also working on a way to add genes to the banana plant so that it will produce molecules that give resistance to hepatitis B, a deadly disease that kills thousands of Africans every year. A $200 inoculation could prevent hepatitis B, but few Africans can afford that amount. A new hepatitis-resistant banana would cost as little as 10 cents. Not only plants, but animals too, can be and are being genetically engineered. Malaria and dengue fever, for instance, are responsible for millions of deaths in Africa every year. Both are carried by mosquitoes. Right now, genetic engineers are working on ways to block a mosquito's sense of smell so that it cannot find a human. Others are working on ways to shorten a mosquito's lifespan so that it can still reproduce but cannot transmit disease. And still others are working on ways to change the disease-causing virus so it kills the mosquito instead of infecting a human. The Gates Foundation has recently given $437 million to work on these and similar genetic engineering projects for global health. All well and good, but could the genetically altered organism cause serious problems once released in the natural environment? Many environmental activists think so. Jeremy Rifkin explains. I've been on record for years saying we need a moratorium. Uh, we should not be releasing any genetically engineered organisms into the ecosystems of the planet at this time simply because we have no risk assessment science. In the area of petrochemical technologies, uh, we have tests that can be done. There is a science of toxicology. There is no such science when we come to genetic engineering. We have no predictive ecology that can measure the relative risks in placing a microbe or a plant or an animal into a complex ecosystem. And so if we don't have the risk assessment science, it seems to me foolish to maintain the fiction that we can regulate uh, the environmental questions. Is, is a position. I mean, I respect his, his opinion on this. Uh, I don't agree with it. I think, first of all, that there is a substantial body of risk assessment science, and that's how one determines whether a chemical is likely to be a carcinogen. So, in fact, a new potato that is produced is tested for its safety, whether it's produced by conventional plant breeding or whether it's produced by genetic engineering. Um, there was a, uh, the, the National uh, Academy of Science can, has convened several major committees to look into this and their conclusion, um, put simply, is that there is no more danger associated with a pro uh, an organism produced by genetically engineered or uh, genetic engineering than there is by one produced by normal uh, genetics, that in, uh, the more conventional means. We asked Jeremy Rifkin how using genetically engineered organisms differs in risk from bringing in non-native plants and animals. Well, I think it's very similar, and we've been arguing that since we brought the first lawsuit back in 1983, which held up the releases in the world for about five years. Uh, the fact is, uh, it, uh, non-native organisms provide a good analogy. We have brought many non-native organisms into this continent over the last 200 years. Uh, many of them have fit into the ecosystems. Some of them have died out. A few have become pests. They have overwhelmed their environment. They've created a powerful niche and they cost billions of dollars in damage. Gypsy moth is one such example. Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight. Uh, these are all non-native organisms and we brought them here, and now we can't get rid of them. Now, I think we have to understand the scale of introductions. In the 21st century, the uh, industry would like to introduce thousands of genetically engineered microbes, plants, and animals in massive commercial volume 
in ecosystems all over the world. Well, Mr. Rifkin made this prediction in the late 1990s. It turned out to be true as to the scale. More than half the soybeans grown in the United States today are genetically engineered. Over one third of the corn grown in the United States is genetically engineered. And around the world, genetically engineered plants and animals were indeed produced in massive volume in 2005. As to dangers, however, so far at least, environmental problems have been minimal. Dr. Burgess suggests why he thinks this is so and will be so in the future. Tremendous diversity of life and, and new organisms are being, and, and variations on organisms are being created all the time. And they have been since the beginning of, of life. Um, many of these are problems. Many of them are problems where they arise, and many of them are problems when they're moved into another environment. Um, that's a concern. But it's no more of a concern than um, organisms, I mean all the examples you gave were organisms that were not created by genetic engineering and were brought in intentionally. I mean, what about the, the organisms that are brought in on people's, in the dirt and on the shoes of people who come in from other countries? Uh, do we want to put a moratorium on travel? because you might introduce a, a, a harmful organism. I mean, it's, I really consider it to be in the same category as putting a moratorium on travel, uh, putting a moratorium on, on the, the testing of these things. When we test uh, an engineered organism that's been engineered to, say, help fix nitrogen to produce natural fertilizer for, for alfalfa and soybeans, we know what we're working with. And it's been tested in the laboratory first, it goes through an extensive review, and in fact, these things are much more carefully controlled and understood than than what one brings in on a on a on, a, on an orange when you bring it in from from the uh, foreign country that you've been traveling on. You know, so there are truly are dangerous and undesirable organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, but they're already there. And we're not, uh, I don't think, uh, this really gets to this question of relative risk. And I think I'd like to say something about that. Every single thing you can think of has associated with it risks and benefits. Um, you know, people are happy to have paved roads. Uh, likewise, we ride in cars, which are extremely dangerous uh, activities because it's convenient. There's some risk and there's some benefit. The same thing is true with genetically engineered organisms. If we want to avoid using chemical pesticides, for example, on our plants, we may want to go to using plants that have engineered into them natural resistance to those pests. So you don't have to spray chemical pesticides on. Okay, well, there's a risk and there's a benefit. There's a risk of some unknown thing happening. It's not a big risk and those risks can be, you know, more and more experiences being gained and they can be assessed. The benefit is that you can avoid using chemicals which are known to be dangerous. Genetic engineering of plants continues to spark controversy. Genetic engineering of animals, and especially of human beings, is equally controversial. Transgenic plants and animals Insulin, BGH, bovine growth hormone, are all examples of products already developed by genetic engineering and being used today by farmers, doctors, and ordinary people. In the last two decades, rapid advances are being made in the most controversial of all genetic engineering projects, investigating and controlling the genetics of human beings. Dr. Lloyd Smith, for instance, heads the team at the University of Wisconsin that made rapid progress in the biggest biological quest of all time, the Human Genome Project. The human genome is nature's four-letter code written in unpunctuated sentences on human chromosomes. It is the blueprint for making a human being that took nature three and a half billion years to create. 
Dr. Smith, along with hundreds of colleagues in laboratories around the world, took 15 years to learn to read and record the entire code. It will take much longer to understand it, but that effort has also begun. By 2003, biologists and genetic engineers did have in computer memory, however, all of the details of the code. And this detailed information offers many new possibilities as well as many new risks. Dr. Smith explains one example of the present day use of this information to diagnose a serious disease, cancer. There's some good examples of that actually. Uh, another company I work with called Visible Genetics has been doing sequencing of the retinoblastoma gene. So it's a gene that's involved in generation of cancers of the eye. And it turns out that if you're in a family that has that gene, then, um, and if you don't do any genetic testing, then you don't know which of your kids have those genes and which don't. Since you don't know, what they end up having to do is they have to do these uh, examinations under general anesthesia of the eye, which are pretty expensive tests, and they have to do them like every six months on young children to detect if there's going to be an early occurrence of this eye cancer, so they can then try to ablate it by laser surgery at an early stage. Uh, so it's very expensive test, and it's very stressful for the children who are exposed to it, and it's stressful for the whole family, and everybody's sort of sitting on a bomb, and they don't know when it's going to go off. So Visible Genetics developed this test that allows them to go in and rapidly sequence those genes from the affected members in the family. Once they do that, they can find out what the mutation is in the gene that's causing the problem, and that allows them to then go and very quickly and easily test the children and find out which children have the bad gene and which don't. The ones that don't right away are free and clear. Okay, they're out of it, no test, no general anesthesia, no, no anxiety, and so that's a huge benefit right away. And then the ones that do, you can also start building up a database to look at what the prognosis is based on different types of mutations and also try to tailor treatments that are specific for those mutations. So in general, that's just an interesting, one interesting example of the social payoff for this, and the social payoff is really going towards targeted treatment for people based on their genetic type, their genotype. Besides the already proven use Dr. Smith explained, genetic engineering research is also making promising strides in curing cancers. The standard cancer treatments today are surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Unfortunately, these treatments are often unsuccessful and can cause severe or even lethal side effects because they destroy many healthy cells as well as cancer cells. Well, building on the new insights into genetic differences between healthy and cancerous cells, new methods are being developed now to attack cancer cells directly, leaving the healthy cells untouched. In 2005, J. Craig Venter, one of the leaders in the Human Genome Project, announced a new, even more revolutionary research venture. This is a step we have all been talking about, he claims. We're moving from reading the genetic code to writing it. He is heading up a new privately funded project to create an entire set of genes from scratch. In other words, to create life itself from scratch, from chemicals. At the beginning, they hope to build enough artificial DNA to make up a complete bacterium genome. Then they will introduce this artificial genome into a bacterium cell whose own genome has been removed. By creating this wholly new kind of life form, they hope to be able to produce totally new species of bacteria. And they predict that these new human-created organisms will be useful in unknown but potentially unlimited set of new applications. Cleaning up polluted soil and water, for instance. Or changing plant cellulose into ethanol. Or producing hydrogen for a new source of energy to power automobiles. Or destroying cancer cells. 
Information gained in the Human Genome Project is fast becoming useful in many other promising fields of genetic engineering, especially in cloning and in stem cells. In cloning, DNA material is taken from body cells of an animal and then inserted into an oocyte, a female egg cell, from which the original DNA material has been removed. The new altered egg cell is stimulated to divide. First it divides into stem cells, and then after a few days these stem cells begin to differentiate into nerve cells, muscle cells, bone cells, and finally form a complete new organism, a cloned reproduction of the original animal. A sheep in Scotland, Dolly, was the first mammal ever cloned in this way from the cell of an adult. By now, in the early 21st century, many thousands of cloned mammals, sheep, cows, mice, cats, monkeys, pigs, testify to the success of this kind of engineering. The hope is that some of these cloned mammals will be of great use in new efforts to test drugs, to produce food, to provide organs for transplantation into humans, and, most important of all, to solve some of the mysteries of disease and health. Dr. Neil First helped prepare the way for Dolly by being the first one to clone cattle from an embryonic cell. Here he explains a benefit of cloning animal cells that has received little notice. There's another kind of transplantation that perhaps isn't so commonly thought about, and it's the transplantation of cells. And the best example of this is, is research with HIV now, where one of the more uh, highly promising therapies on HIV is to engineer the beginning blood cells. We call them stem cells, but they're stem cells for the blood lineage, as different from stem cells of the embryonic lineage. So we have embryonic stem cells that will make any and all cells of an embryo. But these are blood cell lineages. They'll make any and all blood cells. And by starting at that stage and engineering those cells properly, one has the ability to create cells that one will resist the HIV organism so that they'll begin to populate the blood in place of those cells that are susceptible, or two, in some cases, may actually destroy the HIV organism. Now, what cloning does is provide the possibility for an animal, or even a human, I suppose, uh, of, of multiplying those cells, engineering the cells, and then using those cells as a transplant. And with that transplant, interfering with the tumor. Now, it might be a blood-borne tumor, a uh, blood cell tumor, or it might be a solid-state tumor, perhaps, if you can get it delivered to the tumor. But those, ex those prospects are very exciting, and that's, that's what people are really referring to when they talk about transplantation, and, and that more than the organ transplant. Well, many scientists think that no research today offers more promise for breakthroughs in human disease and treatment than work with what are called embryonic stem cells. These are the cells that are formed in the first five or six days after fertilization in the mammalian reproduction cycle. In 1998, James Thompson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison was the first scientist able to culture these early human embryonic cells in culture dishes in the laboratory. One of his close colleagues, Dr. Timothy Mulcahy, explains. Well, I think the simplest way to explain that is what to think of the stem cells as pretty much a blank cell. It's a cell that has the potential to do anything that any cell in the body does, but it hasn't received specific instructions yet as to which particular program to follow. So the beauty of stem cells and the potential that they offer for medicine, for example, is if we can understand uh, the signals that will tell the cells which programs to follow, we could then develop cells, for example, to, to replace cells that are injured in heart attacks. Or we can make neural cells that could replace deficits that people suffer in Parkinson's disease and others. So unlike any other cell in the body, which is already following a preordained program, these cells are sitting there waiting to be told what to do. And if we can understand the science of how to do that, we have a very powerful tool. 
the signals that tell the embryonic cells which programs to follow are given by proteins created in cells using the DNA information on human genes. Much of this information is now available thanks to the completed Human Genome Project. Many of those proteins are going to be the critical triggers for deciding which way this blank cell is going to go when the time comes. And we're already working with investigators on campus to try to look at what genes are uniquely expressed in these cells at their earliest stages. What genes are turned on or turned off when we decide to try to make heart cells from the embryonic stem cells. Having the blueprint available is going to be an invaluable tool to help us sort that out. One scientist learned just which genes influence the stem cells to turn into nerve cells, they will have a potentially powerful tool to treat spinal injuries, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, and other nerve-centered maladies. And when they learn which genes influence the stem cells to turn into heart cells, they will have a powerful tool to test new drugs to prevent heart attacks, as well as a new tool to regenerate heart muscle destroyed in heart attacks. Another research direction is the biology of aging. Ordinary human cells, when taken from the body and cultured in the laboratory dish, grow and divide about 50 times, then lapse into old age and death. Embryonic stem cells, on the other hand, when cultured in the laboratory, divide indefinitely and do not seem to age. If and when biologists figure out the triggers that make ordinary, differentiated cells age, and they already have some strong hints, they may be able to devise gene-based strategies to slow or stop that aging. Well, any use of stem cells is controversial because it does involve the destruction of early embryos which have the potential to grow into newborn babies. Most of the ethical objections to stem cell research come from people who feel strongly that the human embryo, even at its earliest stages, is a human person and entitled to the same protections that all human beings have, whatever their age, abilities, or disabilities. Dr. Robin Alta Chero is an international expert on legal and ethical issues of stem cell and other research involved in reproductive studies. She has recently worked on a national committee appointed by the president to look into these questions. Here is her insight into this ethical issue. I think the debate about what constitutes morally significant forms of life is one that has gone on for centuries and is not likely to be resolved any time in our lifetimes. At base, it touches on things that cannot be proved and things that cannot be explored through experimentation. For example, whether you think that the essence of moral significance lies in potentiality or you think the essence of moral significance lies in, in, in a kind of an experiential view of life. That is, uh, if you believe that the mere potential to develop under the right circumstances into a baby means that this form of life must be protected. In other words, the acorn should be protected as if it were already an oak. Then you're making this value judgment based upon a vision of the world that kind of transcends time in which we see life as part of a continuum across time. We see harm to an embryo, not in terms of the embryo's own experience of harm, but in terms of some kind of wrong to the child that would be, right? On the other hand, there are people for whom that is not a relevant factor and they ask only, do we have an entity that can experience itself and can feel disappointment, pain, in other words, can be harmed. And they look at an embryo and say, no, it doesn't even have the biological substrates to be self-aware, to have formed a desire to continue to exist. And so cutting off its existence in no way thwarts its desires or harms it. And these are very different views about moral significance, and they can't be brought together. So the challenge is not to come to a consensus about the moral status of early forms of life. The challenge is to develop the appropriate public policy how is it that we want to govern ourselves given these entrenched differences? That's the real question. 
Well, how can we as a society then decide such irreconcilable differences? Should we simply put them up to a vote and let the majority rule? Well, I personally believe that there's actually a lot of guidance within the philosophy of our Constitution. The United States is not governed by pure popular majority. Instead, we have a mix. On topics that encompass rather ordinary sets of concerns, we allow the popular will to prevail. Should people be allowed to drink or drive or vote uh, uh, or drink or drive at 18 or at 20 or at 21, and we put that to a popular vote. On the other hand, there are areas of life that we have said are so fundamental, so central to our personal identities or to our civic life, that even when the popular sentiment would suggest that these activities should be restricted, we will permit them until the most compelling argument has been made for restriction and until we have been shown that there's no other way to handle this concern other than restricting the activity. Those are things that are listed in the Bill of Rights, like the freedom of association, of speech, of practicing your own religion. Uh, and it's also um, a set of things that have been identified by the Supreme Court as implicit within the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, such as the freedom to marry. Now, one of the areas that we need to examine is the freedom of scientific inquiry. There have been suggestions over the years that this is something akin to free speech, that just as free speech ensures the long-term stability of a civic society by providing an outlet for dissent, something other than violent revolution, does scientific inquiry, by ensuring the continued development of new knowledge, help to stabilize society or destabilize society? In my mind, that's a very important question because if we see it as fundamental to the long-term stability of a civic society, then it's something that needs to be protected even against the popular will. Well, what about the future? What will happen 10 to 20 years from now with stem cell and other genetic engineering research, scientifically and ethically? At present, the legal status of stem cell research in the United States is a mixed story. Some states have passed laws to ban both reproductive and therapeutic cloning for stem cell research. Other states are considering such bans. On the other hand, some states, like California, have passed popularly supported referendums to give generous support to stem cell research in all its variations. On the federal level, there are no laws at present restricting stem cell research. The U.S. government, however, has ordered the National Institutes of Health to refuse federal funding for any stem cell research using embryonic stem cell lines created after August 9, 2001. This restriction is being contested by many scientists as well as many scientific, religious, and political groups. And there are similar conflicts about the ethical and legal status of all forms of genetic engineering in Central and South America and in some Western European countries. In 1998, environmental activists in Switzerland sponsored a national referendum that would have banned production and distribution of transgenic animals. It would ban field trials with genetically modified organisms of any sort and it would not allow patents of genetically modified animals and plants. The referendum was voted down by two-thirds of the Swiss voters. Countries in Asia, like China, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, on the other hand, place few or no restrictions on embryonic stem cell research nor on genetic engineering. And scientists there are making rapid progress on many frontiers of genetic engineering and cutting-edge biology. How fast will progress take us in the 21st century? No one can be sure. Dr. Mulcahy gives voice to the majority view of scientists today about stem cell research. Um, I would say 10 to 20 years from now, I fully expect that we'll have a number of effective treatments based on uh, embryonic stem cells. I also would predict that much like uh, what happened in the case of in vitro fertilization, 
which at its inception was a real hot button, it will evolve into a much more accepted and uh, appreciated medical tool. And so too, most scientists predict that in the many other varied fields of genetic engineering, food production, environmental protection, disease prevention and cure, species preservation, energy production, poverty alleviation, climate control, reproduction help, pollution cleanup, and more, as the benefits become well known, public acceptance will follow. The 19th and 20th centuries are known as the centuries of the Industrial Revolution. Most experts predict that the 21st century will be the century of biological revolution.